Welcome to the Doctor Patient Forum, a no holds barred patient advocacy podcast discussing why millions of pain patients continue to suffer, but most importantly, who caused the suffering. Join us as we discuss how you can help end the untreated pain crisis. Many of you know that we started a Patreon page about four months ago. As always, we would like to give a quick shout out to all of our new patrons that have joined since we published our last podcast. If you are interested in checking out our Patreon page, it's patreon.com slash the doctor patient forum. A shout out and huge thank you to Lindy, D, Troy, Diana, Beth, Carol, Meg, Allison, Rebecca, Lindsay, Dana, Cynthia, Nellie, Sarah, Jackie, Melissa, Jana, Sandy, John, Amy, Nancy, Albert, Melissa, Monica, Ange, Zarina, Kelly, and Lisa. Before we get into our podcast and you hear Claudia introduce our guest in today's episode, I just wanted to read a quick introduction that our guest sent to us. Our guest today is Dennis James Capalongo, a retired patient advocate and former director of the EDNC in Washington, D.C., His 25-year career as a photojournalist came to an abrupt end after having been misdiagnosed with a disc herniation for minor hip pain in 2001. Unfortunately, this led to a calamity of errors resulting in two subdural epidural steroid injections using Pfizer's Depomedrol, an off-label unapproved application of particulate steroid suspensions. He suffered progressive irreparable harm to his brain, spinal cord, and eyes. His efforts at the FDA resulted in new warnings and revisions for all injectable steroids worldwide. Today, he spends most days in bed controlling the severe adverse effects of these life-altering, unlicensed pain management procedures. Welcome to this episode of the Dr. Patient Forum podcast. You could be watching us on Patreon. You're maybe watching this video or you're listening to us on the podcast, the Dr. Patient Forum podcast. Don't forget, folks, if you like what you heard today, make sure you leave us a stellar review. Throughout our journey in patient advocacy, we've heard so much about epidural steroid injections, and now they've been used as a weapon for a lot of people. And joining us today is Dennis Capilongo. He, you know, he's the victim of epidural epidural steroid injections, and he has a wealth of knowledge. Welcome to the podcast, Dennis. Thank you. So Dennis, let's start from the very beginning. Tell us about your life before you were injured by an epidural steroid injection. Well, I'm a photojournalist by training. My agency in New York was where I'm from was Black Star, which is an internationally renowned known photo agency. And we were contractual photographers covering stories all over the planet. And so we carry very heavy bags of, of, of gear, especially running through the halls of the White House. And I developed a small pain in my right hip, not in my back, not in my legs, my mm-hmm. right hip. So my primary care doctor said, why don't we go and see an orthopedic? So one day after work, I went there with all my gear. And he said, boy, you know, this sounds to me, I have a hunch that you have a herniated disc. So I can do a bunch of sympathetic nerve blocks it sounded good, sympathetic, not realizing at the time he was talking about the sympathetic nervous system. So he said, but you got to let me know right away. I'm doing a bunch of these this afternoon. So it was the pressure game. Sure. So I fell for it. I said, sure, but I don't do them here in my office. You got to come with me to my office in another part of town. And I go there and there's people lined up like a, like a line of people at a bank, mm-hmm. all waiting to get in. Mm-hmm. And that was the red flag. I went in, gave me the injection, didn't tell me really what it was, what he was injecting, but I started screaming. The next thing I know, I uh, I woke up in a hospital and he said, well, uh, we found out what it is and you need an injection right now, another one right now. I said, no, you're not. And then he said, well, then we have to do immediate surgery right now. I said, you didn't do any imaging. And this was an orthopedic surgeon. Right. Exactly. So is the nerve block, is that the same as an epidural steroid injection? Yes, indeed, it is. Okay. Because a lot of times... Technically, you want to get into technical, do we want to go technical? Well, we can go a little technical, but this is because our people that are listening to this, these are lay people, and these these are gimmicks that are being forced on pain patients, right? And they're, they're, they're saying, listen, if you don't agree to the injections, 
we can't prescribe your pain medication. And I've worked with lawyers who provide these guys compliance and they're like, well, yeah, I mean, that's what they do, interventional pain doctors. But we've learned so, so mm-hmm. much about how well, this was 2001. Are. This is okay, right before so 9-11. Way, you're going way back, 2001. So you're working. You sound like you, I mean, you're in the, you're all over the country. It very, sounds like very busy. As a photographer, you have a uh, pain in your hip. Now I start From all the heavy it. gear that we carry. Absolutely. Carried. But once these doctors, once they're done talking to you, you're so confused by the yeah. information. And, and when they say, well, right now, right, I don't do anything right now. Nothing now. So well, they take get... advantage of your absolutely of your lack of knowledge and your desperation to get That's rid right. of the pain. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They bank on your desperation That's right it. there. And there's a lot of money in these injections. Yep. When you said, so they do the, the first injection when you were at his office, right? And there was all these other people waiting to get these injections. Were you awake for that injection? Yes. Okay. And it hurt when they were going in with the needle. The second shot he gave me without telling me. And some people tell me that they blacked out because the pain is so bad. Correct. Once the needle goes in and once the steroid is in your body, people are telling me that they black out or some are vomiting or their, their sugar spike. So, okay. Now, do you get another injection or do you leave that day? He gave me a dual injection on the same day. Okay, which is unorthodox, but he did it anyway. Okay. And that's because he didn't follow the proper protocol. He went completely ad lib with this. Mm-hmm. He had no no imaging backup to verify his theoretical diagnosis. How did he know if he was injecting the right spot if there was no imaging? Now I'm talking about diagnostic imaging or any other physical anomaly, it could be seen on an MRI. That's before mm-hmm. they're supposed to go in and do any of this invasive sure stuff right okay however he didn't do that okay i have a hunch he said uh, a hunch and like so, a jerk i wow. said okay so you had because a clairvoyant he... orthopedic yeah. surgeon <laughs> basically exactly. a clairvoyant yeah. orthopedic surgeon who nilly willy takes a needle filled with a steroid and and just he had a hunch and he went with his hunch his hunch was wrong yes and also the fluoroscopy that he did have at his disposal mm-hmm. really didn't help him at all or aid in his placement of the needle, which is often the case. After 21 years of advocacy, I can say that we've learned that the fluoroscopy, which they call fluoroscopic guidance, mm-hmm. it helps prevent any real risk. It's a bunch of baloney. What really happens, they use the fluoroscopy to tell they just made a, they can see they just made a mistake. So oh. they can doctor up their documents. Oh, my god! It's gosh. not there for the patient. And the FDA already put that in writing. It says in all of the data sheets for all of the drugs that they're using that severe adverse events have happened with and without fluoroscopy. In other words, it really is no assurance. So, Dennis, I want to go back to the day of the procedure. He gives you two injections. What happens after that? I wake up in the hospital. And uh, I wanted to know what happened. In pain, I have a morphine drip already in my arm. Mm -hmm. And I said, what happened here? And he said, well, we found out what it is. You need immediate surgery or another injection. I said, nothing doing. How do you know what it is without having any imaging Mm -hmm. of what it is? Oh, by your reaction. Okay. All right. So how long were you in? So you were in the hospital for how long? For that day, what's important is something that I didn't say, I didn't tell you, is that being an investigative photojournalist, something told me right away. Plus, you know, you care for family members. You get to know what doctors are all about. And I said, you know, doctor, you're fired. Mm -hmm. And the next time you see this face, and I pointed to my face, it's going to be in front of a judge. Now get out of this room. I don't Mm -hmm. want to see your face for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. until we see you in the judge. And I made sure that the hospital heard this. Nobody came in after that. Oh, my God. For hours. Yeah. Oh gosh. yeah. So I was all by myself. Mm-hmm. One nurse came in several hours later and increased the dosage of my morphine drip. Well, that, that wouldn't happen today, Dennis. Yeah. Those days, <laughs> Those oh, days absolutely are long not. gone. Those days Those are, days are long not. gone. Yeah. They would just probably, Dennis, today they would probably just escort you to the psych ward. Or, or they exactly. would call the station. Or right? they would call the police. Yeah. Or they'd Cuff call you. the police. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, how Drag long you out were you, chains. How long were you yeah, in the hospital? No, they do. I was in for several days, but then I went back, back and forth for almost three years, back and oh forth. Oh, my God, you poor guy. And you Lost knew right job. away. Like, you knew, obviously, it was from the That something went wrong. Yeah. 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 And I think oftentimes, you know, we know our body. When I take somebody to pain management or wherever, I always tell the, the doctor, they know their body better than you know their body. You know what I often say to doctors, which is very interesting? When they doubt what you're saying or yeah. when they doubt that you know what you're talking about or something. Right, right. I say, doctor, what car do you drive? And they go, oh, brand new BMW, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, do you have an onboard diagnostic system on your screen? Yeah. Yes, I do. It tells me when something needs to be done. Consider this mouth an onboard <laughs> diagnostic system. Right, right, yeah. This yeah. is my onboard diagnostic. Sure. Yeah, and you if you're not going to listen to it, you're yeah. going to crash the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? People are just so afraid to advocate for themselves, especially the pain patients, because they, they're just treated like rabid dogs. You know, I know when I had to advocate for my mom when her breast cancer came back, I, I think from... When the surgeon walked into the room, it was five minutes. She came in, oh, your cancer's back. We're going to schedule your double uh, mastectomy. And you're like all fucked up from this news, right? You're in a state of shock. And before you know it, my mom and I, we laugh about it. She, they're giving us a mastectomy pillow. I said, <laughs> what? what the? F I said, what's going on? I said, hold the phone. You're not taking my mother's breast off because she's 86 years old. Let's talk about this. Yeah. And when you sit down and you try to have a rational conversation with these doctors, they don't like the people. Now, no. Bev has all the best questions in the world. <laughs> I don't have as many questions as Bev does. But when I advocate for somebody, I got questions. Yeah. I want answers. And if yeah. you can't deliver the answers, yeah. hasta valista, baby. <laughs> Dennis, yeah. tell me how your life was affected after this steroid injection. Well, what's interesting is that no one could tell me what happened. And back then in 2001... There was nothing on the internet. Yeah. Zero. So I started doubting what I was feeling and I started yeah. doubting right. my perspective. And right. I started doubting myself and my own instincts. Right, yeah. right, yeah. And the next thing you realize is so is your family, mm -hmm. so are your loved ones, yeah. so yeah. are your friends, colleagues, and your business the uh, uh, bosses. They're all looking at you like, right. it's all in your head. You're right. crazy. Yeah. You're out of this your mind. Is called, this is called the mind fuck of being yeah. a pain patient where you're like, am I imagining this? It's yeah, like when you go to the emergency hurt. room and maybe you're suffering hurt. and they yeah. call you a drug seeker and you're discharged and next thing you know, you're getting admitted and you leave with the colostomy bag and you're like, am I imagining this pain? So it sounds like your life took a, it took a hit. It took a big hit. Mm -hmm. uh, not only marriage wise, we just yeah. had a, a new baby and, uh, wow. you know, I was, I wanted to be there. So there was a massive, massive hit to my family life, mm -hmm. as well as my professional life. Because months later, I get a call from several of my contractual workers that get your ass up to New York, Dennis. A plane just went into the World Trade Center. Oh, oh wow. That's right. And I'm, I'm from New York. Sure. I know all the ins and outs. I also was best friends with the governor. So I had these connections. I couldn't move. Oh, man. I was stuck in bed. Because the pain was that severe. Tell well, because the arachnoiditis, which okay. was what eventually I was diagnosed with, was progressing. And mm -hmm. with that progression came insurmountable amount of, of symptoms that are undescribable. What is, for, for our listeners, what is arachnoiditis if they're not familiar with it? If indeed you get any kind of foreign material into your spinal cord, by mistake, even if you're in a car accident, let's say, and you get blood, your own blood into the spinal fluid, it will cause a severe adverse event. Your immune system will try to rectify. So it's, an, it's a severe immuno response to a foreign body inside your CSF, your cerebral spinal fluid, which, mm -hmm. by the way, is so clear when it's, if it's ever removed from your spinal cord that if you put it in a glass... It looks empty. Really? Because it's so clear. And so, and th this so was anything that you put three in injections, it, just those three injections destroyed your life. Well, there were two. The effect of any kind of foreign material, if you get bacteria in there, mm -hmm. you know, you get meningitis. It was in the meninges, which is part of the structure of the system, immune response. But in arachnoiditis, is a little bit different. 
Chemical arachnoiditis is, is the most severe. There are chemicals within the steroids that they use that are like the strongest alcohol you can ever imagine. Now, when you put alcohol on a cut, it burns and it stings and so forth. Now, imagine putting that into your central nervous system, the entire nervous system. It would be the equivalent of taking a gallon of water. It's so disruptive that it completely eliminates any other pain. Somebody could be stabbing you to death. And you could say, just keep doing that. It's distracting me from the arachnoiditis. And, and so many of our members have been diagnosed with yeah. adhesive arachnoiditis after being subjected because they're being, they're being forced to get these injections. And these pain clinics are set up just to do these painful, unnecessary We call them factories. Procedures. We call factories. them injection mills. Yeah, I call yeah. them drill mills. That's our term. And I think the drill mill at this point is far more harmful than the, than the pill mills ever were because before there was a safe supply of drugs on the street and now if they've been replaced with these really harmful drill mills and, and it's just, there's so much conversation surrounding. Well, let me just say, if I may, sure, of course. And that is that when my advocacy took hold and Mm -hmm. I started getting inroads at FDA, and NIH and so forth, institutes of medicine, any kind of reports that I was getting from social advocates that work with immigrant farm workers uh, would call me and say, listen, we've got a big problem going on here in California and in Texas. We have immigrants, legal immigrants, you know, they they come over, but when they get injured on the job, because they're constantly picking up, Mm -hmm. you know, these big, big pallets of food, they hurt their backs, they're giving epidurals at these factories, at these farms. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Oh, my uh, God. But what's surprising is that they're doing it to children. Oh. Children farm workers coming mm. in from other countries. And when something goes wrong and they start screaming. Oh, my gosh. Because we found that they're not doctors that are doing it. These are dentists yeah. that are doing God. it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for a big flat fee. Right to Arthur Daniels Midland and all of these other big industrial farming companies. And when they get into trouble, they're being thrown into vans and dumped over the border like garbage oh my to gosh. fend for themselves. So when now, I say that to the FDA, mm-hmm. they took notice. Okay. They all took right. Notice. So let's, let's get, let's go back a little. Now yeah. you're, you're stuck at home, you're in bed. And eventually you start your path to advocacy, right? Why did you, did you just dedicate your life to this advocacy because you were bed bound? I dedicated it to it when I found that they, A, were not even approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people don't realize that. That's really important, Claudia. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's not FDA approved. And yeah. every, ever since you told me that, Dennis, when I talk to a patient that, that contacts us, most of them do not know that it wasn't Well, they know now. Improved. I mean, TikTok because has about, been an yeah. invaluable, yeah. Has yeah, been but an they, invaluable resource. But They're not told late. by their doctor. But it That's, is too it's, late. It's already it too, too late. late. For millions of people because you trust these doctors. And listen, we're the doctor-patient form. Obviously, we support doctors. We yeah. work with doctors, but yeah. there's a lot of really shitty, dishonest human beings that found their way into medicine. And I have a real problem with these drill mills. I mean, it makes me sick because they're destroying people's lives. Well, now, here's a story that I think falls into that. Go ahead. Now, there are two doctors that back in the 70s and 80s, two neurologists, Dr. Dewey Nelson and Dr. William Landau. These two guys worked at some of the best hospitals in the country. And they were approached by the makers of Depomedrol to say, hey, wink, wink. Uh, We know it's really meant for like in a joint, Mm -hmm. but we're finding that in Japan, they're having great results if you get it epidurally. And they thought, oh, really? So what they did is they started injecting their patients. Make a long story short, patients started screaming and yelling with an unknown condition. When they looked into it further, they were discovering that the arachnoid membrane inside their spinal cords was swelling up to such a point they were adhering to one another they would squeeze into one another and become one Mm -hmm. so if you had lots of spaghetti going down a tube let's say and you cook it so much that it expands it becomes one solid piece of spaghetti oh my gosh Mm -hmm. well 
Dr. Nelson went berserk, completely berserk, started screaming at everybody. He even trashed the exam room. He eventually ends up at the FDA, and he argues that there are doctors out there that are out of control, and this has to end immediately. Well, he was given a handshake and told to leave, basically, and it took years and years and years, but he finally got it contraindicated for intrathecal injection, not epidural, because that's inside the spinal cord. Shoot ahead a couple of decades, and here comes this investigative photojournalist giving him a call. I found him, and I looked him up, and he said, Dennis, I've been waiting 25 years for this phone call. Wow. 25 years. Dennis, is there any cure for you? No, there's, there's no, no cure. cure. There's no However, cure. However, let me finish the story. He said, there are three types of doctors in this country. You've got your scholars that do all the investigative work, do all the studies, write the journals and direct the way medicine is supposed to be practiced. Then you got your trauma doctors. And then Dennis, you've got the scumbags. These are the guys out there that are looking to make money to pay off their student loans mm -hmm. as fast as they can. And these are usually the pain management doctors. Mm -hmm. We used to shun them all the time. They were the lowest of the lowest because yeah, they didn't know that. what the heck they were talking yeah, no, about. I've heard that all the time. I, I heard that all the time from a former colleague of ours who who was an anesthesiologist. He and said it all so the time. these guys found a way to make it very lucrative. Right, right. Con the patients, never mm -hmm. give them proper informed consent, never tell them that it's not FDA approved, mm -hmm. that it'll knock the pain out of you like that, and people fall for it. Yeah. And then when the shit hits the fan, sure. they say to the patients, oh, it's all in your head. Right, right. Oh, you want more pain meds? Really, yeah. I can't give them to you. Right. You need more injections. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That's the other thing. Oh, no. You know, you, it's to be expected because the people are telling us that. Yeah. Because I, when I have my in-person support groups, I ask these people, I was like, well, wait a minute. Did the injection, you, you're getting these injections because you're going to get caught off of your pain medication. She's like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I have to do it. My question is, are the injections helping you? Well, well, it's yet. Yeah, I know that if I have to take a pain pill, I know it's helping me. I know when I go to physical therapy, it's helping me because I feel relief. But it's I, a trick. I it's think a trick. These people it's are like really having a confused. dog, yeah. and you say, "Roll over. Here's your treat. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want your pain, your pain meds? Yeah. Roll over and let me give you an injection. Right. Same right. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, and now, so and now, what's so bad is people are being injured by these things. Like, and it's not just this; it's spinal cord stimulators and, and they other. Keep getting them, and but they then, get them. and then they're cutting off their payment. So now this is an iatrogenic right. thing where people are injured because of what the doctors are doing. And now the doctors are like, "I can't treat that." See, ya. Right. Exactly. or or they're discharged because yeah. um, they're non-compliant and they're yeah. getting a psych evaluation. It's a vicious cycle. It's it really, terrible. it's just awful. So. Dennis, tell me, did you have a, like a, a nonprofit, an organization that you started? I what started was... an advocacy group comprised mostly of professionals that were harmed in the same way. Okay. Professional business people that were harmed. And we called it the End Depot Now campaign or the EDNC. All right. End Depot. For people that are listening, it's that's End. E-N-D. E-N-D. Yeah. E -N -D. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. End Depot. Depo that... now for Depomedrol, which was yeah. the steroid. That's the yeah. steroid. And Depo now campaign. Okay. And it took off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It and took if, off. And eventually, you would find your way to the FDA. You 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 That's were correct. able to get the air of which is very very difficult to do yeah. in yeah. this country. Well, that's because they knew the truth. The way into the FDA was through Kaladni <laughs> and his program to eliminate proper care, pain management for those that are suffering chronically. And you're referring to Andrew Kalogny. The prop, the prop hearing. He's with yeah. the organization Prop. Uh, and if you folks follow our work, I refer to Prop as a hate organization because they, yeah. they have a pension for the disabled. Yeah. And so I appeared at the prop hearing. So, so Claudia, there. what that hearing he's talking about, you know, the 2012 mm -hmm. petition, we always talk about that prop petition they send to the FDA mm -hmm. requesting a change in labeling for opioids. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they had a subsequent hearing. And that's the hearing that Dennis went to, which is the only reason I ever even heard of him because I was reading like a crazy person every word of these transcripts trying to figure out what we can do to help this situation and I found his name on there talking and he sounded like he had some sense like he was actually 
not sounding like these crazy like zealots. And mm-hmm. so I like took a chance to reach out to him and I'm like, you might think I'm crazy, but, and he called me back. It was a few years ago now. And he had done a lot of work with Terry Lewis, but yeah, you want to tell us about that hearing, Dennis? Well, the, the funny part about that hearing is, is that I knew who Dr. Kolodny was. I covered him when he was running Phoenix House in New York City. Really? Okay. When he was a photojournalist, he took pictures. Wow. When I was a photojournalist, yeah. wow. I covered yeah. that okay. story. Yeah. And anyway, not to get into, into the weeds of that, when I heard that Kolodny was advocating against the distribution of proper pain meds, to those with arachnoiditis. I called the FDA and spoke to a few doctors there and they basically said, we need to change the policy. We're finding that, I said, well, wait a second. What about those that are legitimately in pain? Mm -hmm. That have a severe problem because of a botched epidural steroid injection, Mm -hmm. giving them arachnoiditis. Mm -hmm. The response, what's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't even know what it was. They didn't even know what it was. Right, right. So when I got to the hearings, in the shape that I was in, this is some years later, matter of fact, a decade later, I had already made some inroads at FDA, but CEDAR, which is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at FDA, they headed up this entire, I guess, show. Mm -hmm. But the head of it, or the the assistant director, Dr. Throckmorton, and I explained to him, listen, there are two types of pain patients out there. There are those that somehow end up dependent on the drug because they weren't Mm well-managed or they're thrill thrill seekers raiding their parents. But then you've got this third entity that they're in chronic pain for no other reason than a botched medical procedure. Yeah. Now you're going to victimize them again. And he said, I totally agree. He said, so don't do this. Don't adopt prop the blanket bomb the entire pain community. Not Mm -hmm. right. It's not, I agree with you. To his credit, he agreed. When I got to the meeting, it, it appears that he was either given the heads up or something had happened that he knew who I was. I felt that he recognized me from the past. But see, the EDNC on YouTube was getting lots of traction at the time. Yeah. So it could be that he already had seen my videos. But what he did is, which was very mean, he decided, I'm going to use these moms mm-hmm. whose children the have been... Right. Who, right who overdosed, to go and attack it him. Is. That's right. And he, he sent over this, I don't want to give a bad name. But They're like a sent, mob. They're like a mob, he right? Sent, he sent over his mob of ladies mm-hmm. that I sympathized with, and I told them that as they approached me. But all they would do is stick their fingers in my face, mm-hmm. screaming, you're going to have the blood of hundreds of thousands of more children Ugh. who are going to overdose and so I said, well, did you ever consider patients mm-hmm. that need the drug to manage their day? This has nothing to do with patients. Right, right. Which told me right there and then mm-hmm. that they were missing the point. So I got up, my presentations on my on my website, and I, I told Throckmorton, Kolodny, and everybody else that was there, listen, there's another crowd of people out here that really need well-managed opioid yeah. care just to have a semblance of a normal life. And even that, none of you can comprehend Mm -hmm. the daily experiences of people with arachnoiditis. And I have to admit that some of the panel not only applauded, but they liked what they heard. And when PROP was adopted, I had a lump in my pit of my stomach, knowing what was going to happen to hundreds of us. Mm -hmm. And it happened. I can't tell you how many suicides happened. Yeah. Million. I, I mean, it, the, the millions of people who have been cut off of millions. medication because of, of him. And he, yeah. ugh, the, this is what we, people always say, how did this happen? How did this happen? Mm-hmm. And we've mm-hmm. been saying this for so long and we're attacked for it. They manipulated the grief of parents to yeah. push this through. They go to the legislators, even men out, they talk about finding the legislators who have family members who did die from an overdose having nothing to do with pain medication. It doesn't matter. They got these yeah. parents together and they pushed it through that way. And they're still yeah. doing it. It was. Yeah. A, they were used as a tool very effectively, especially sure. on Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. after PROP was adopted, we went to Capitol Hill. And I can't tell you how many representatives said, oh yeah, last week we had all these mothers in here. Oh my gosh. And you know what? Well, the first time I met with my Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, he thought I was crazy. He's like, Claudia. Yeah. Do you know how many wakes I go to for overdoses? I was like, well, for, for street fentanyl overdoses, I was like, but 
probably not a whole lot for people who died from pain medication alone. Those are those are rare to find. And that was years ago. Well, their ignorance right. of the true facts behind this hmm. were were exploited by interventional pain physicians. And that's right. the part that, De Claudia, when I first reached out to Dennis a few years ago, mm -hmm. remember I called you, I was like, oh my God, this is a part that, a piece that we've been missing in the entire story of how they pushed this through. Because we knew like the rehab addiction industry with like Phoenix House and all of that. And then we knew that they were gonna make money and we knew just like litigation, mm -hmm. they were making money. But this is the part that we were missing. And when I talked to Dennis, I was like, this is it, the interventional pain. So, so Dennis, you think that the interventional pain kind of joined forces with like Kalani's group and as far as pushing this opioid elimination? Absolutely. There's definitely a collaboration between the two groups. Mm -hmm. And that we feel was not only explained to us by members within the FDA and at NIH and at CDC and at Institutes of Medicine, but they basically said, it's all in an effort to help patients. Right, right. I said, well, what about those that have incurable diseases of the spinal cord mm -hmm. or central nervous system? Mm -hmm. Are you going to allow them to live in this hell because of one doctor? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to try to at least give them a get out of jail card, which yeah. I proposed? Yeah. yeah. Give these people a get out of jail card yeah. that doesn't limit them to a, a course of opioids for six months for seven days. Right. They can go back to the regiment that were being regulated by their, the true pain doctors, sure. not these opportunists that were yeah. trying to exploit the system. And what yeah. happened here is that the Kalogny team and the interventional pain team, they came together and said, voila, we've got the perfect formula. Mm -hmm. And the perfect formula is this. You don't want any more opioid deaths? Let's get rid of that as the first course protocol. Let's get rid of that as the first course for those that have back pain. Let's recommend epidural steroid injections first, mm -hmm. and then we can eliminate the scripts for opioids. Mm -hmm. So we'll go straight in, no other protocol other than injections first, rather than let's see how it goes, give us some time, let's go to a physical therapist, let's see what happens with a small course of this medication to dull, dull the pain? No. Oh, you've got a pain in your back. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you this injection. It'll knock it right out of you. And the next thing you know, yeah. you're screaming in the hospital room mm -hmm. and nobody wants to touch you. Yeah. yeah. And, and it then seems they say like, it's all in your head. Right. It seems like they went for the low back people the first. I mean, well, that's because it was the common. That's what they mm -hmm. say. Like the most common Right. issue that people become disabled and that they stop working and that they go to the doctor for pain is low back pain. Low, they call it like low back pain or neck pain. And then they went for the headaches. They're and the largest demographic in That's society. Why. And then if they pain. continue. Yeah. And so like with the papers that just came out, they'll, they said, because it used to be don't use it for first line of defense. And now they're saying don't use it even for last line of defense because they're saying the most common reason why people are given opioids in this world is for low back pain. So if we can get rid of that completely, then we'll cut opioids. And the, the way they pulled that off, they went to CMS, the Center right. for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This was a decade before PROP. And they went in there and they said, we have a great idea. We can eliminate extremely expensive expenditures and bring down the budget for pain patients. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to propose epidural steroid injection therapies and we will reduce the amount See? of surgical outcomes. Mm -hmm. CMS went, wow. See that? You'll, this, yes. is a, this is amazing. We're going to yeah. save you money. We're we're gonna gonna wait a minute, million. but wait a minute, because these doctors, they're reimbursed quite a bit of money for these procedures. Yeah, but they're. This, they're, is, this they, is before they took hold. This is how it took hold. They told CMS if you do this procedure, you won't have to do sub subsequent surgeries. So you're going to save 1970s all this money. 1970s through 1980s, and then full blast during the 90s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they. No. So yeah, they thought they would save money in the long run, which, and then that's also how they sold opioid elimination because they say to them. If you give this opioid, which doesn't cost a lot of money, you will be paying for a lifetime of addiction treatment. So they so look don't. at their expenditures right in yeah. front of us. Dr. Terry Lewis and I and, and, and Terry Anderson, we went in and we sat with CMS and they showed us their expenditures. And they said, back surgeries are out of control. Stimulators are getting up there on the top. Morphine pumps, all of these implants, 
they're getting out of hand. And if we can reduce those expenditures through a $2,000, $3,000 procedure rather than a $30,000 or a $200,000 procedure, we're going to do it. I said, well, did you know that they're not FDA approved? How could they not? This is CMS. How do these people not know this? They looked at us like, they didn't know. oh, absolutely it is, Dennis. Stop giving us a run around, blah, 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 blah. I said, can I make a phone call? Mm-hmm. Sure. So we used the desk phone, and we called Dr. Throckmorton mm-hmm. at, at Cedar at FDA. And I explained where I am. I explained what's going on. I'm here at CMS. Doctor, can you please explain to these members here, most of them are doctors, whether or not epidural steroid injections have ever been approved? Because they're claiming that because they have given it a code for reimbursement, mm-hmm. that it must be approved. Mm-hmm. Oh, Okay. Yeah, guys, it's not FDA approved. They turned as white as the wall behind them. And I said, how much? And then I said to Dr. Throckmorton, do you know how much the federal government is reimbursing these doctors annually for something that's not approved? He says, it's got to be in the hundreds of millions. And you know, Dennis, when I say this in any of the videos that I put out, people are like, well, I mean, we use drugs off label all the time. I was like, but this is different. This is a needle in somebody's spine. They are crippling people. They are harming people. Well, there's a, there's a big difference. I'm hit with that same argument, and I used to say to them, well, there's two types of off-label use, mm-hmm. one that benefits the patient and one that benefits the doctor. Sure. Yeah. That's a good way so, of saying it, right, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I say, so those are the two uses of off-label use. Mm-hmm. And in this case, there's hundreds and hundreds of confirmed studies that show that people are being adversely affected without any concern for their well-being, That's that right. it's so lucrative that they're being lied to. And that's the reason why I went to 60 Minutes with this story. And they were so interested in it. And that lasted for about a year, working with the producers. And then all of a sudden, Pfizer, out of nowhere, which we have our suspicions about, became one of 60 Minutes' top, top sponsors. And Pfizer makes makes the product. the, The steroid. Yeah. And the story was killed. What a so surprise. the same producers and, and reporters that were working on that said, where should we go with this? I said, I don't know. we got to get it on the air. Mm-hmm. So Elizabeth Leamy, who was a consumer reporter for ABC, which I knew from previous stories, not related to this, mm-hmm. she went to Dr. Oz with the story. Actually, she went to Oprah with the story, and they got it. We supplied all the information Dr. Oz was just the mouthpiece for this. Mm -hmm. And so when we finally got Elizabeth Leamy wired up with a hidden camera, and when she got on camera, when she asked, are these injections FDA approved to the nurse? I saw that. I saw that. And the nurse said, oh, absolutely. They're actually designed for these. Right, right. Oh, my God. Right. (laughs) That's what patients are told. Yep. All the time. Sure, sure. And then I saw the, the part of the clip where the doctor was saying it was the doctor speaking to the patient. It was just a great, great piece. How can people watch that Dr. Oz segment? Do you have that still on your website? I know it's, it's, it's circulating up. all over TikTok. It's going to be on. So, and Claudia, after, just so you know, after uh, we get this podcast out and edited, I'm going to be adding a section to our website with mm-hmm. his um, epidural steroid injection information, with, with his NDEP now campaign videos we're going to embed them right onto the website okay, so people okay. can watch them right there and we could just excellent, send the links excellent. to people yep. now i heard that pfizer actually contacted the fda right didn't pfizer contact the fda they wanted the fda to it's a very interesting story if i may yeah what happened in my research so it 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 it, it grew exponentially it started snowballing the information I would get these packets in the mail, these mysterious packets, loaded with data on disk. Where? People within the agencies putting them together, wow. putting in the mail without a return address and mailing them to me. Really? Wow. Holy so as shit. this thing started growing, this is this is the story, the true story. Pharmacia Upjohn is the makers of this steroid. As in, like I said, it was originally used for livestock, work in the fields all day, and they got back aches. So this, So they would inject them with steroids until the horses would die. That's really where it began, back in the 30s. Pharmacia Upjohn. Pharmacia Upjohn was then acquired by Pfizer. And I have a copy of their their papers to do a complete vetting of the company by their attorneys, Pfizer's attorneys, looking for drugs of high liability. And out of the seven or eight drugs that Pfizer was making at the time, Depamedrol was at the top of the list, exposing Pfizer to massive liability. 
eventually. Mm -hmm. So they knew even back then yeah. that this, this steroid was going to be exploited by pain doctors. It had the potential of doing catastrophic harm. And they said, hmm, maybe we shouldn't acquire this company. But what they did is they used it to cut the price, the asking price in half. Oh my gosh. That's what they did to get mm -hmm. a better deal. So when they assumed the liability of this product, they then contacted, what should we do about this to limit our liability? Well, we can't contraindicate it because that will mean that we know right. that it's bad. Right. Sure. So let's put out a not for or a must not or not recommended. Yeah, yeah. And they started putting this on their labels all around mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. But then as the advocacy groups like mine and others started pushing hard, they sent out a document that said, all right, we're contraindicating it for epidural use. And the way that happened was I proposed to Pfizer and I proposed to the FDA. If you're not afraid of this drug, then approve it. If you want to make all these doctors rich, yeah. that it's harmful to people, that's right. why you want right. to prove it. So right. Pfizer tried to beat this right. massive tidal wave that could be coming. Yeah. And they started sending letters to all the health authorities around the world mm -hmm. with a correction to the data sheet to contraindicate the steroid for epidural use. They even sent it to the FDA. And the reason that they won't contraindicate it in this country is that this country holds what's called the master data sheet. So when a country holds the master data sheet for any medication or any device, that means that any change that happens at the master data sheet has to trickle down to the rest of the planet. But if it happens segmentally in the in the world, here and there, mm -hmm. it doesn't feed back to the company or to the FDA. So the FDA made a calculated move. We will entertain a hearing on the efficacy of this procedure with the caveat is we hold the final decision as to whether or not it should be contraindicated. Even though I obtained a copy, it was sent to us, of the tracking changes that the company sent out to all the subcontractors as well as the FDA and all the health authorities around the planet, contraindicated, do this. Here in the, in the United States, when I approached the FDA and had many meetings with them over maybe a year, a year, a little less than a year, should I say his name? Mm. Yeah. Dr. White. <laughs> Dr. White shut the door in a conference room said, Dennis, we're not the Food, Drug, and People Administration. Understand? Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are the Food and Drug Industry Administration. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I can tell. Your entire halls are being crisscrossed every day with the people industry. that have big manufacturing names on their tags. Right. I don't see anybody representing patients in here. There's not one patient nope. advocate walking these halls nope. except for me. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I'm going to tell you something, Dennis. We have Wall Street to consider. Oh, and that's a God. problem. And that's yeah. a problem right there. That's well, we it. We, all of our phones were confiscated when you go into the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can't record. But I know what happened to me there. They basically just laid down the gauntlet. Mm -hmm. Forget it, Dennis. Right. You're not going to get this contraindicated here. And at the hearing, who was part of the FDA's panel? Because you've got the advisory panel on one side of the stage, and then you have the FDA panel and the mediator sitting in the middle. And all the crowd in the audience, what did the FDA have? Secret weapon? They had a secret operative from Pfizer. Unnamed. Oh, my gosh. We have pictures of him. Unnamed. Oh and he had gosh. no voting rights. And he couldn't speak. But he was there pulling the strings like a puppet master of what the FDA did. And at the very end of this meeting, after all the patients I had brought in to speak about their experiences, after I gave my presentation, and so forth. The advisory panel said, we need to contraindicate this. And it was 17 to 4 was the vote. You know what the FDA said? What? We'll take it under advisement. Oh, my God. Three weeks later? No, we're not doing it. Nothing. Because, Dennis, they've been banned in other countries, right? They've been banned because of the efforts of advocates like our group and several others. Okay. We teamed up. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say it's a, it's a, it's a patient advocate collaborative we are a collaborative mm -hmm. so we all focused our efforts around the planet it's even contraindicated in russia wow. now this is the odd part about everything mm -hmm. even though it's contraindicated doctors can still do it dennis do you think these uh you know they were in medical school and then they decide to specialize in pain medicine do you think these doctors know how harmful these steroid injections in the back are, or 
do they just plow forward and they don't care about the patient? Because this is this is very serious shit that's going on here. It's, well, people, one of the videos that we know. supplied Elizabeth Leamy that was on the Dr. Oz video, it's in two parts, mm -hmm. is that they started giving interventional pain societies, like the American Interventional Pain Doctors and, and ISIS and a few others. What they started doing is they started giving courses at their annual meetings on epidural steroid injections. We got this one video of a doctor saying, well, I took this weekend course. Right, yeah, another time. And I realized how lucrative it is. Right, it's the right. best part of yeah, and, yeah. and then they're sold. Yeah, a doctor told me his own words. He's like, yeah, I did this in a weekend. A weekend set. I mean, they only have, they have to learn this craft in a weekend. And didn't you tell me, Dennis, in like the interventional pain conventions that they just like teach them how to make the most money? Like, isn't that what it's about? It's more than that. We had a reporter go in and infiltrate some of these classes and what they reported back was frightening they not only teach this procedure they teach you how to doctor up your their documents to make sure that they're not going to be sued the wording right and in with sub, for several cases we found that the fluoroscopic images that they mm -hmm. were taking of each of these procedures which becomes part of the patient record this one factory was using the same set of pictures for all of their patients what oh god she's using it's the so same scary. pictures it's, it's the it's a scam. It, yeah, the whole thing really, is crazy. Really and, is. you know, um, you taught me or you told me about Dr. Manchikanti. He was like that. He started ASIP, like the Interventional Pain Organization or whatever. And yeah, the American, the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. Yes. Yeah. And so, of course, they hold these conventions and he's been speaking about the dangers of opioids over the years. He did some work with Roger Chow at one point. But I find it very interesting that this new study that just came out opal about low back pain and how you should never use opioids how the, he was a peer reviewer on it and if you look at his statement in the peer review what Manchikanti said was wait a second you're not expressing enough the harms of opioids and the death and destruction that they cause and, and the long-term efficacy and the long See, that's where they that's where they've got this whole thing wrong and that's what because they that's what they made him do. Because of him, they added death and discretion. Claudia, because of Manticondi's comment, they went back and said, we're going to test him in a year. And what did they find out in a year? Oh, there's evidence of harm in a year. You take six weeks of opioids, 52, 46 weeks later, you're going to be, risk of misuse is going to be higher mm -hmm. and pain is going to be worse. And that was because of Manticondi, because if he can get them to not give opioids ever, for yeah. any back pain, I mean, imagine the windfall for interventional Wait, pain. Where, where for is injections. He, where is he based out of? Kentucky. He's out of Kentucky. So they all found their way to each other, all of the anti-opioid wackos. And with Kalani, too. Like, they joined with, for, like, we don't have the 100% evidence. I know you said you've seen something, but didn't you say you thought that Kalani was asked to speak at one point at one of their conventions? He did. He did speak. What year do you think that was? It had to be around 2008 through 10, somewhere in there. Makes sense. It's right about that time. Do they have their own lobbyist or many lobbyist interventional pain? Because this, this <laughs> they could be in the halls. They are so up. well funded. It is out of, out of this world. Yeah. Do they use a certain lobbying firm? Back in 2008, the chronic pain doctor community, if you want to say, or the industry, mm -hmm. they would grow somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five hundred million a year on procedures and other interventions. Now, if they had a, a five dollar vial of OxyContin, that mm -hmm. could be regulated, and all they get back is two dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Or you can do thirty injections a day. Uh, sure. Yeah. Which one are you going to migrate right, right. to? Yeah, there's no money in just writing a script for OxyContin. No. And no. I think you know, it's so I I, I got to go. TikTok has been an invaluable resource because that's where the people are now, yeah. and they're all saying no more injections. And it's weird because we were invited to speak at a pain conference for yeah. interventional pain people, and. One of them, the one doctor's like, you know, you got to stop bashing interventional pain. I was like, no, I don't. No, I said, I'm, we're just truth seekers. And truthfully speaking, interventional pain has harmed people. 
I, yeah. and, and, and there's all these pop-ups, like Rhode Island has a new pop-up nonprofit, uh, Opioid uh, Council to Prevent Opioid Dependence. And I called them right away and I said, what, what's your goal? Well, she said, well, I like getting the injections. I was like, you're fucking great. I said, you're so ill-informed on the issue because they, they get paid by all of these companies to boast epidural steroid injections. And, and I'm an opioid advocate. People need opioids who have been subjected to botched surgeries who have yeah. been subjected to a life of pain and su- suffering yeah and claudia that's i want to tell you like dennis has said you know his organization was around for a long time and didn't hmm. you say dennis like just in the last year you've gotten such a huge uptick in people There's contacting a massive you massive uptick in the last because they're all being cut off months. of opioids yeah and wait he, it's gonna you're gonna it's whoop, gonna get worse your phone you're not you're gonna have uh, a surge of people well i have to say you. that in 2017 i retired from my advocacy mm-hmm. because of an incident another botched <laughs> incident yeah. Yeah. uh that yeah. <laughs> did some major damage to my brain and so the thing is i never turn anybody away yeah mm-hmm. i've had people knock on my door in full uniform coming out of walter reed saying my wife found you on the internet and we were surprised to see you so close to walter reed can i come in and tell you what happened to me i never turned them down mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. never i think claudia i think we need to have a couple of series i think this needs to be part one oh, of, oh my god of a bunch because story your, yeah, this story is so fascinating. And I always tell Claudia, I'm like, Dennis knows everything there is to know about epidural steroid injections. Like, this is where we get the information. We, this is the history involved. You work with Terry Lewis. You know all of the ins and outs of this, and we have to get this recorded so that yeah. you know we the can. The backstory have this. is frightening. It terrifies yeah. me. It, it's though it is. It's really, really scary. But you just there is you, a there is an Italian doctor who went on tape. And he said, I used to give epidural steroid injections, and then I needed one. Yeah. And now I have arachnoiditis. Oh, and wow. We, and, and and let me you know tell what? you, I put wow. the gun to my head right. every night. Right. And, I never had any idea. And see, the thing is, Claudia, Dr. Tennant was one of the big proponents of arachnoiditis to teach that this is existing so people know mm-hmm. about it, and they took him out. And he was I shot. He was shut down. That's right? why I think. I think they took him out because of that. They want people to shut up. They don't want people to talk about it. And yeah. it's really, it's it's terrifying. But I would like, before we wrap this up today, there well, is. Can I say one, can I yeah, say two things? If you're a young yeah. doctor who follows us, because I know a lot of pain management doctors follow our work. You got to dig down deep. Yeah. You got to find your moral compass. Yeah. You can't you just can't harm people. And we have a lot of supporters who are in They don't realize they are. They no, but that's what we have to that's the that's, other part. That's what we have to discuss because I have supporters that are interventional pain doctors and in their mind yeah. they're helping. They don't realize yeah. what's happening to these nope. people long term and this has to be discussed. This has to be yeah. uncovered because I have older doctors who contact me for help because now they're old. And there's nobody who's willing to treat their pain, right? Well, Dr. Nancy Epstein, if I may. Yeah. She's, she's out in Long Island. Yeah. She works at North Shore. She's also a professor at the yeah. uh, Albert Einstein School. She's a surgeon, a brain spine surgeon. Yeah. And she wrote this scathing paper. This paper is so scathing about interventional pain doctors and what yeah. they're doing that sadly she had to admit that she has to turn away people that have had epidural steroid injections. No surgeries anymore. Yeah. yeah. None. I want to. That's because she's yeah. sick of opening people up after <sighs> they say, "You need to help me, doctor. Please help me. Mm-hmm. I'm in so much pain." And she Dennis? looks at their images and she, "Did you have epidural steroid injections?" Mm-hmm. And they would lie. They would say, "No." Right. Why? Right. No. Okay. Good. I'll go in. Mm-hmm. And then she opens up their backs. Yeah. And she sees the destruction. She said oh. it's like a cluster bomb went through their spine. Oh no. And I have to sew them back up oh my and say, why did you lie to me? Well, mm-hmm. I was afraid you weren't going to take me. And we need to this, talk to this doctor. You need to talk to this and doctor. And the other one, Jana, Jana Friedley, you said? Jana Friedley. They're we my need heroes. To, Claudia, we need to talk to them. Jana Friedley, was, she was on Dr. Oz, right? We selected her for Oz, yes. And she's the one I sent you one of her studies, Claudia. She talks about the harms of epidural, how it doesn't, because this is what Dennis was saying, that the way that they they sold it to, to uh, insurance CMS. is to, say, to CMS yeah. is to say you're going to have fewer surgeries. If you just do these, then you'll have fewer surgeries. But she right. actually showed them. 
And that then she showed the opposite. exact opposite. That if you have these injections, you yeah. will have more surgeries. And so... Um, more opioids. More surgeries. More everything. Yeah. These more injections pain. make things worse, not better. You know, when you're going up against the most powerful narrative in the world right now, and the most powerful narrative is opioids are bad. Here, do this, do this, do this to avoid taking opioids. I tell people it would be easier for me to go on national television and it would be easier for me to convince people to start smoking cigarettes again, right? And so, Yeah, yeah exactly. but there's a flip to that, Claudia. There's a flip to this. And that is when people say to me, we need to eliminate opioids. We need to eliminate it. I say, I understand that. It's not a very good thing to have unless it's being well managed, but you need to eliminate all the iatrogenic faults in the system that are causing people to, to want them. to be on opioids. That's Get it. Get rid of the source and you'll improve the other end. Mm -hmm. Don't remove what any kind of benefit that they can find. Take it out of the arsenal, right. out of doctors that are caring. They didn't ask to become dependent on opioids. They yeah. went in for a little hip pain. Mm -hmm. and the next thing they know, they're screaming bloody murder. Sure. So, and, yeah. so it, and it seems like it's it's been anecdotally, people tell me the steroid injections have made my pain worse. I've never been the same. I developed a leak. A leak. I, I yeah. need a blood patch. And this is all this is all language that was very new to me. And I'm a, yeah, I'm, I know. A, I'm a former court reporter and I'm Googling What's well, blood consider patch? this, Claudia. Yeah. Consider that around the arachnoid space, you've got hundreds and hundreds of feeder arteries and veins and a complete vascular network, right? Mm -hmm. And out of that, at each level, there are these nerve roots coming out of the spinal cord, feeding the various muscles and organs at each level. When they go in with an epidural, even if it's done correctly, even if it's done perfectly, they slaughter all of that vascular network. And the amount of blood that it creates in there is incredible. The surgeons are telling me, oh, it, it, it's a bloodbath as they puncture that needle into the epidural space. Forget about intrathecal for mm -hmm. a second. Let's just talk about externally in the epidural space. Then they put in their stuff, they remove it. Thank you very much, your money's gone. Mm -hmm. That blood over time mm -hmm. coagulates and encapsulates oh all gosh. of these nerve roots that are coming out of the spine. Scar tissue. <sighs> that scar tissue creates new symptoms, no more pain. They go back to the doctor and they say, I don't know what's ha what happened. It was pretty good for about a week, right? but the pain, pain's coming back. Yes. So well, Dr. Nancy Epstein explained what happens. The blood dries up. You get the scarring. All of the nerve roots are encapsulated in a crust. She said you can't even scrape it off with a scalpel, okay? But that encapsulation causes those nerves to trigger. So more pain develops. When they put in the next steroid, mm -hmm. number two, as they want to do, and the patient goes, ooh, that feels good, because it dissolves that encapsulation. But there's more blood now. Yeah. And See then that. the cycle begins again. And that's why there are people getting 200 300 That's injections. Right. You know, Claudia, remember how you said to me, why do they keep getting them? I don't understand. And I was like, because they get that relief. The way that Dennis explained it, they do get a relief at first, and then they keep needing to get it to get that tiny right. bit of relief, but they're and causing what is, it. What does the doctor say to them? Oh, whatever is going on in there is getting worse. We need another injection. Because to change. there are people that say, oh, yeah. You know, I can oh, walk. Absolutely. I walk. I can walk because of the injections. I was like, well, how long can you walk after just one injection? Like, does your pain improve after just? No, we gotta. We've gotta separate. This injection in the in the back is different from getting that same. What is it called? Depo. Steroid. Right. So like we've had them in our knee and right. shoulder. That's where they're indicated. That's yeah. where they're approved. Because they've helped me tremendously. Right. I, my shoulder. No yeah. vascular network. Yeah. It's it's all cartilage on cartilage. Yeah. Okay. Et cetera. And it works. Right. It's like it's like brilliant. I knew. Yes. My wife went for several miracle. epidural, not excuse me, several depomedral injections into her knee. Yes. She's a tennis player. Right, right, yeah. And pe Works because wonders. here in the elbow and Bev, and my mom gets them in the knee. So this is very different once you go into that epidural state. Now, do you think the FDA will ever contraindicate the, this? Will this happen? When the bosses of the system that they work for mm -hmm. say to them, mm -hmm. we found another drug. We found something new. Mm -hmm. We don't need Decatron. We don't need these steroids anymore. Mm -hmm. Then they'll change it. So you're retired now. I'm retired now. And what do you do with your time? 
right now. Mm-hmm. I care for my family. Mm-hmm. I spend mm-hmm. most of my time. I read a lot. Now there are days. I'm right now pumped with a lot of steroid, oral steroid, to reduce inflammation in my head. So you're taking prednisone. Because his arachnoiditis spread to his brain. Spread my to your brain. My arachnoiditis is intracranial. Now I've yeah. got to ask you this. Did you consider uh, filing a malpractice case against yes, the doctor? We did. Okay. Yes, we did. Mm-hmm. Expert witnesses back then either didn't, had no idea about this. They were under the impression that it was FDA approved. Yeah. And we just couldn't find an expert witness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear that. Yep, I know. I'm a former court reporter, and I know how difficult it is to get expert, with, especially in my state in Rhode Island. It, it's really... Yeah, but it's different now. It is. I get calls from people up in New York, mm-hmm. as far as way California, even as far as way as New Zealand. Can they sue and, and be successful? They can sue now. Mm-hmm. They this can sue what... now. We put a new warning. We were granted yeah. a new warning... Ex- we didn't get a contraindication in the United States. This is what advocacy does. Listen to what they were able to get. We were able to get the FDA to put a warning box on the package inserts for all ster- injectable steroids. Mm-hmm. That it's not FDA approved, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Number two, we don't condone this, nor should you even agree to it. Doesn't the pain management doctor have a waiver relieving them of Basically. any liability associated? Well, technically, with- the FDA does in their in their mission statement, they're not allowed to tell doctors how to practice medicine. So technically, mm-hmm. which was I was reminded of many times at the FDA, they can inject gasoline into mm-hmm. your spine mm-hmm. legally if you give them a signed informed consent. Right. A signed, inf- it's always... Even if it's contraindicated. You know, our long-term goal on our website, Claudia, is I would like to, we're going to add the information about Dennis's organization and at all of his videos and, and um, resources, which are plenty. And then it would be good if we can maybe, I don't know, Dennis had suggested last week, if we could maybe have like a little, I don't know what, like, these are some lawyers you could try to call. These are some experts that know what they're talking about something. So we can kind of, or at least show them these are the legislators you to write need to. need a something. referral service. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, so we need to find yes. some lawyers that we can refer them to who might be willing to talk to them because they're being injured worse and worse. And now they're not being treated with opioids. So now they're like being forced. Now they're left. I mean, and it's where to so- go is also yeah. is to their insurance companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But all of these insurance companies. They're just misinformed. Covering. No, no, there's not an intentional cover up. It's just they're misinformed. Yeah. Because, because no, I mean, when you're a child, does... listen to this, when you're a child and mm-hmm. your mother says, we're going to the doctor and you go to the doctor mm-hmm. and you're this little kid, two feet high. And your mother says, listen to the good doctor, right. Claudia, the good doctor knows what they're doing. And Isn't you look up truth? and you see this guy in white. Right, right. right. He's looking down at you mm-hmm. and he picks you up yep. and he hugs you. Your trust is bonded. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when you're older and mm-hmm. you're at a doctor's office, mm-hmm. I can get that pain knocked out of you with one injection. That's right. Yeah. You go, okay, mm-hmm. because we're trained that way. Sure, sure. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Never oh, again. Right, right. I yeah. go into doctor's offices, they hate my guts. Yeah, yeah. I, I've yeah. been fired. Yeah, me too. I think, um, you know, I said when I started this, you know, you're raised from such a young age to hold these doctors to, you know, this high esteem. But you know what I say? At the end of the day, we all have the same size coffin. And, <laughs> and I learned this early on when we would get on conference calls and these doctors, well, I'm, I'm Harvard educated. I would say, we're all Harvard educated on this phone call today. Yeah. Because it, what's happened to the pain sufferers of the United States is, it's a genocide. I, can I ask you one question? Because I don't know where you stand about on, I believe that opioids are safe and effective for the treatment of both acute and chronic pain. That's just where I stand on this issue. Yeah. So I've got a, an 18 year old and a 22 year old. And when they had their wisdom teeth removed, I held on to the opioids. And my mom lost her son. My brother died from taking copious amounts of ibuprofen, and we never sued the makers of ibuprofen. And my mom doesn't vilify doctors for prescribing ibuprofen, but I believe, and I know that opioids work every single time. And I've called these interventional pain doctors, and one time an office manager was like, oh, of course they work. It goes right to the source of the pain. Because this is this is like a cult. Yeah, it's terrible. With these, 
with these steroid injections, but it puts us in a like a, a, a difficult space because so many of, of our our supporters are in interventional pain. You know what you need to ask me? Mm-hmm. How do I manage my pain now? That, well, that's what I was going to ask you. I, I was like tiptoeing around it because I don't know where you stand. So I'm going to ask you the question. How do you manage your pain now? Many, many years ago, I made that decision to wean myself off of oxycodone, Oxycontin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And it was extremely risky, to say the least. I don't know how many times I would say, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done with this. It was meeting certain doctors that are aware, that understand, that are going through chronic pain themselves, and they can't even write scripts for themselves. There is a holistic approach. I'm for opioid treatments, well managed opioid treatments for those with chronic and intractable pain of the central nervous system. No one, no one can tell me that a doctor or anybody else can explain what it must be like to live with arachnoiditis. Yeah. No one. Yeah. Unless you have it yourself. And even then, depending on the gravity of it or how Mm -hmm. severe it is, Mm -hmm. it could be different. I dare any doctor to explain to me what it's like to live with arachnoiditis. It's beyond their imaginative comprehension. Mm. They cannot... They can't fool me. Anybody with arachnoiditis, when a doctor, oh, I, I sympathize with you. Right. Oh, right. yeah, you know, I have 10 patients like you. Yeah. I'm so aware of these things. Well, thanks, doctor. Mm-hmm. What can you do for me? Can you help me with my pain? Mm-hmm. Can you help me remanage what prop took away from me? Now, have you tried well, ketamine? Well, I can't go there. Have you, did... tried ke- have you tried ketamine, Dennis? Yes. Did it help? Short term. Yeah. Did opioids actually help you when you were taking them, though? Absolutely. They did. Okay. And when you, you came off of them because you didn't want to be dependent on the doctors like that? I can't or... see okay, uh, let me be honest. Real... Dennis, yeah, I let's... can't see you going to a pain clinic and being terrorized oh, by I have. And the drug test. I've and been the ridiculed, pills. thrown out on my, on my face. But why did you come off of it, though? You said you weaned yourself off. Why? If you were to step into my shoes yeah. for a normal person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Out of the blue, without years of dealing with this, they 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 would drop to your knees and scream. And we hear that from arachnoiditis patients. And sometimes we say, like, because, you know, we've talked about this, Dennis. Some patients in the pain, chronic pain community kind of lose their mind. And we've wondered why. And I think that's one of the reasons why they've lost their, because how you deal with that relentless pain in and like, Every day. Unrelenting pain, day in and day out, and day in and day out, and day in. It's gonna make you lose your mind. Like how else do you? And the depression. Well, there's something to be said said about that. Mm -hmm. I've lost my mind. Yeah. Over time, you compartmentalize. Yeah. You you put the pain that's over here in this segment of the brain. Yeah. The pain that's over there in that segment, and I can live with these. This will put these all in a different folder. Yeah. These I can't deal with. So there was. A possibility that today I would say, Bev, I can't yeah. do it. I'm up in bed. Yeah. With the shades pulled and that's it. Because I suffer with severe cluster and migraines on top of everything else. Yeah. This it's... eye, the retina, it had exploded. Not macular degeneration. I mean, macular destruction. What they've done to people, what they do to people with this stuff, and they're continuing to do it. You know, we talk it's about lucrative. The, the, we talk about this Opal series that just came out in uh, this Lancet series about low back pain, and really, I actually agree with a lot of what the Lancet series says. It basically is you shouldn't do imaging on the first day. You shouldn't be giving all of these surgeries and steroid injections and medications that don't work when really, if you just hang on for about six weeks, you'll probably be able to get better without anything. And then you're not going to create lifetime patients. So I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. But what I want to know is they focused on epidural steroid injections in this series and they were like, don't do them. Don't do them. They have this choosing wisely campaign where they're like, most countries say not to ever Ever use them mm-hmm. but the only thing that they focused on in this country is the let's not use opioids part yeah our right. country isn't focusing on steroid injections spinal cord stimulators nerve ablations fusion surgeries all these things at all because why is it because of the money from from interventional pain lobby is that why well the the, the latest data that i looked at for every 350 injections that this country does mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. England does one. Wow. Oh my gosh. Crazy. That's socialized medicine mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. versus profitable medicine. See, in our country, 
then like in Australia, it benefits them to say we shouldn't do these certain, we shouldn't do these injections because then they're going to create, we're going to have to pay more money for these people. Where Long in, run, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In our country, they're, they don't care. The doctors make money doing it. And then as long as they don't have to give opioids now, then, then they're right. free to go. And then, and the yeah. other part is, it, so, so now you have all these patients who are injured and like you and, and sick and in pain and everything. Now you're that's not what gonna, Dr. Friedley pointed out. So now they're going to just gaslight them though, right? Dennis, now they talk about right. arachnoiditis as though it's a mental illness, as though it's an, mm-hmm. like a munch They have to belittle it, which mm-hmm. they can't. But they do. They put uh, it in, a, especially the young doctors, they put it in the same category as CRPS, and which they Absolutely. also explain it as pain that you could never imagine. These are suicide diseases. That's what these, they are. These, this is a system in this country. It's all profit driven. The FDA has said it to my face. We are not the Food, Drug, and People Administration. We are the Food, Drug Industry mm-hmm. Administration. That's who we answer to. Yeah. We have Wall Street to consider. Like Bextra, hundreds and hundreds of people die. Three years after Bextra's red flags went up, did the state or the national government step forward and say, we have to stop Bextra? Right. Yeah, we need to stay. Yeah, we did it. And we settled for $300 million, the largest settlement from a pharmaceutical ever. I well, we advocates consider that a payoff yeah, or a payback. Right, absolutely. It's like with gabapentin. That's being shoved down people's throats. I mean, gabapentin for this, gabapentin for that. Now I've got. Now I'm hearing of studies being done about dementia stemming yeah. from gabapentin. Yeah. Dennis, every time I put videos about gabapentin, they garner like three million views. These medications are so harmful for people, and you know the way doctors respond, Claudia. Many medications are used off label, and gabapentin is just one of them. And I'm like, are you people? Fucking Pfizer, because you know Pfizer did gabapentin too, and they were hit with the biggest lawsuit there ever was at that point for that medication. And that lawsuit money was used to fund mm-hmm. Farmed Out with Adrian Few Berman. That's used to sue other pharmaceutical companies. So it's all this big machine, and and it's just that they know they put money aside. They know they're going to be sued. They use that money and then they move on. Gabapentin was part of this Lancet series also. They don't want people using it. They're like, there's no evidence of benefit. But our country doesn't seem to be talking about that part. For, although they exactly. are now. They are now. Now all of a sudden you see studies coming out about Gabapentin. They can't lose money. That's the yeah. outcome of the FDA. Yeah. That's it. We will That's go it. in and do any correction you want us to do. That's what it boils down only to. only after they're made whole. Yeah. If not profiting. Yeah, that's what it boils with, down to. With, with Bextra, it was the same way. So they touted this incredible settlement, the Attorney General's office. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is an amazing, the largest ever in American history. The amount of money they made in those 10 years was 10 times more than the settlement. Mm-hmm. So they paid the government $1, but they pocketed right. $9. And that's what's mm. going to happen now with Suboxone. Like, you mm. know there's going to be a... There's been two huge lawsuits against Indivier. You know there's going to be more because they're, they're pushing it. Like, there's no tomorrow. They're saying it's not well, addictive. You you, before I forget, you know, I've organized a protest before outside Kolodny's office at Brandeis University. We're organizing again this October. Dennis, if you're willing to come back on it a couple more times so we can maybe talk about... Absolutely. Dennis, you've had a, very a pleasure. Cool, you've had a very cool life. Folks, thanks for taking time out of your day to join us here on the Doctor Patient Forum podcast. If you have questions for myself or for Bev or for Dennis, uh, don't forget, leave them here. And don't forget to continue, please, if you can, support our Patreon page. We humbly thank you for your support. You keep fighting and we'll do the same. We absolutely loved this interview with Dennis. If you would like to see it in its entirety in the video, including the full two hour plus recording with before the podcast and after the podcast, head on over to our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash the doctor patient forum. And you can see the entire video. I am just going to include a short clip of our after the podcast discussion because I found it interesting and I hope that you do also. Hope to see you over on Patreon. And you've had a thousand lives because listen, when I interview people, Usually, like after three minutes, I was like, "Who the fuck am I even talking to right now?" And but you're you really you know you really piqued my attention today. So I think you're well, thank very, you. I thank think you you're for having it. Cool I can tell. I, I can tell you, Dennis, that she's actually interested because usually right around forty minutes, she's like, "I gotta go. Yeah, bye. I'm out. I'm gonna wrap it up." So the fact that you've lasted this head, long, yeah. I've got three terabits of information. I've got dossiers that would make you stand on your head. 
of people that killed themselves over this. Sure. Weeping families. But I know all the ins and outs of how this all happened. You don't want to write a book? You know, I was thinking of that, to be, uh, to be honest with you. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? That's a good idea. And all those I, stories together, for sure. Oh, and your God. your advocacy, what you've done, that whole story with FDA oh, and all of that, and Dr. Oz, FDA. and that crazy right. doctor who ran off oh. the stage, all of that. Yeah. Oh, he what a piece of work. He How about the fact that every single person I come in talk, contact with about it, Dennis is like, oh, yeah, I know him. We worked yeah. with him. <laughs> he ran it's off the stage. It's been 20, 21 years, you know, yeah. and if you're really, you know, really active in it, you're going to get to know people. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the Italian, what my grandmother used to say, we can smell a rat. Oh, bad. There's just something about bad. a rat. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's uh, your mom's favorite that's, word, right, Claudia? Yeah, rat, yeah. Well, dirty and, you know, rat. We've, Listen, we've got that category government paid rat now because, and you know, there's a, yeah, my, do. my, the doctor who does my Botox, he's a psychiatrist, but he's Italian. And he, I said to him, you know what, if you were in Rhode Island and you did what Kaladni did, you would get cement shoes here. There's no question about it. Like, yeah. we don't, we, we don't fuck around here. My brother was the head of special victims for Providence Police. And listen, things just get done a little bit. I tell Bev all the time, I was like, you you don't understand. We just operate a little bit differently. And I'm, I, you know, I always say I'm always polite, but I'm never censored. And I am always polite, but. But you are I never have, censored. <laughs> No, Just, I won't be censored. And yeah. I had a hearing at the state house with, he's in New York now. He's that was the head of Rhode Island Department of Health. He was about three feet tall. His name is Jim, James McDonald. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I shouldn't have gone to the hearing because it was right after I buried my brother. And I think I had treatment that day and I just felt like shit. And I just saw him and something happened inside of me. And I actually I put him right in the corner and I said, let me tell you something. I said, you're, you've killed people. And he's like, oh my God, you're hostile. I was like, you have no idea. <laughs> Why wouldn't you be hostile? Why wouldn't we be no hostile? Idea. I said, Why you're hurting oh. people. You're hurting people. Like we're not even allowed and to be angry. You can't even be angry. And he's gone. And I say, I would say Larry, Moe and Curly have vacated the state of Rhode Island. <laughs> good, riz good riddance. Because there's just, there's not, there's no truth seekers anymore. Nobody wants to be truthful. And I don't advocate for opioids as the first line of defense. No. And we don't, we don't, add, we don't want our kids taking opioids nilly willy. That's not no. who we are. No. But you need, you can't live in a civilized society without access to opioids. No, it is. Well, see, yeah. The thing about about opioid and its effects on chronic pain. If indeed I didn't have the opioids that were originally prescribed to me or put into my arm, I would have jumped out the window mm -hmm. of that hospital. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. not kidding you. Yeah. It basically saved my life. That's an important sentence. Can I take, I'm going to use that little sound bite because that's a yeah, really important yeah. sentence because they did say, it, like it you would have, wouldn't. It saved me. Right. The amount of pain I had then, the amount of pain I have now, mm -hmm. completely different. Yeah. But Dennis, the if initial, that had happened now, you wouldn't have gotten opioids. No, I, was throw, I would not be here to talk with you. We're, we've created an, an unimaginable situation. You can't do orthopedic It's a pressure surgery. cooker. It's, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to overflow. Yeah. The pressure cooker is yeah. going to burst. And then we're going to be tagged as murderers. Right, right. Oh, I think I've already Which we already, we've that. already started. Yeah, They've already, already started. We're dangerous. Pain patients are dangerous. Pain patients shouldn't be allowed to have drug guns. Seeking, drug seeking. Doctor wouldn't give them the drugs. Yeah. Blew them away. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Not realizing, not realizing the press doesn't know that there's a backstory to this. All right. Listen, thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. We'll schedule the next time. I'll send it to you when we're done. Thank you once again for listening to our podcast. If you're enjoying our podcast, please follow us on Spotify, leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and share with anyone that you think might benefit from this information. Just a quick disclaimer, the information contained in this podcast should not be considered medical or legal advice.